Hey, this is Andrew McLaren here. We're going to be talking about reaction mechanisms today and, or kinetics of reactions. Um, oftentimes when people work with these rate laws, they get really confused. And this is like all you're given on a typical college or AP test. And so I wanted to help you understand some other tricks to, or to help you get some frames of reference with these, um, because it's it's a really important thing to be able to understand the general principles here and then be able to apply them. And then we'll go over some typical problems as well so that you can um, solve these in a number of different ways without understanding any calculus because the, the math is kind of weird on this. Um, and if you don't understand calculus, it's kind of tricky to explain some of the formulas and like what, like exactly how they are derived but you can still think about the relationships and do some basic uh, tricks to, to check it and get the same effect. So on a typical chemistry test, you'll have these formulas and you'll see that there's some uh, concentrations of A here. There's this rate constant and time, and they've also given us half-life, which is pretty important. So this is half-life right here. Um, and then you may notice that these things are very different relationships with the natural logs and the one over. And this has to do with the, the order of reaction. One of these is for one order of reaction and the other is for a second, but that's only two. And there's usually three that we're talking about. We usually talk about zero first and second order reactions. And when we're talking about the order of a reaction, it's basically the, uh, the magnitude of the number or how how big the exponent is so when we're talking about a zero order it basically is something where the rate is it doesn't really matter what the concentration of a is the rate is what it is it's always a constant rate no matter what you how much you have of a the rate is constant so if you double how much a you have the rate stays the same so it's going to take twice as long to get rid of that stuff so this is not like a a constant half-life so the half-life is variable so it's uh half-life is variable so you can kind of think through that and these are things that i would just like jot down on on the test honestly when i go through this stuff just like remind myself oh yeah zero order this is what this looks like first second and just go over that. There are third and fourth order ones, but those are very, very rare. You don't typically see those. Um, they're very like unstable reactions, essentially, when you have that many things coming together. So they're kind of rare, right? So we've got this stuff where it's like, okay, this half-life is kind of variable for the zero order. Then this first order reaction, what this is basically saying is that if you have twice as much of a the rate gets twice as big so if um, you have like 2a then you're gonna have like two times the rate right so if you have 2a what you're essentially doing is you're also saying two times the rate um, and so this is going to end up having the half-life be the same so the half life is constant so this is just a good thing to keep in mind is so when we're talking about like uh, radioactive decay that's something that's a first order reaction and if you understand order reactions that kind of makes sense because it only takes a single atom to break apart it's not two things like colliding and so it's not like you're gonna have like these this uh, order that would go along with that right so you've got like this first order is kind of like your typical half-lifes and you can actually also prove that mathematically. Um, it's kind of cool. It basically has to do with like substituting in some numbers here. So if you want to talk about like the math of the first order reactions, let's just do that really quick. The math of uh, half-life. The half-life, which is sometimes written with this little symbol, right? So we've got this like T half-life um, which is also like, I'm just going to write half-life, and then this symbol is sometimes what they um, they show for like half-lives as well. So it's 
I know it's kind of annoying that they do that, but that's just kind of what there is going on here. So if you actually plug in some numbers here, I think this is the one for the, the first order. This is the one for the second order. And the, um, the zero order, they don't even write it. They don't even give it to you. It's actually, I believe, a uh, T minus A initial is equal to uh, like the, the KT. Um, I think it's, yeah, I believe it's a positive KT. It's either, it, this might be negative or positive. But basically, the rate is just going to be determined like saying, okay, there's this change between this, these two things over a given amount of time. So like, if you have more, um, then it's going to have a bigger change, right? So that's like the main idea there. So I actually did just a little plugging in of some numbers, thinking about like initial being 10, and then our final being six and five. And it actually does have to be a, a negative in here for this statement to be true. Um, but you can see that the, uh, the K is constant with what I've done here, it's just negative one. Um, and so it just kind of equates for that change. And so, yeah, that's this is the um, the formula that you would have for the zero order to equate the concentrations of A at different points in time um, compared to what it was initially, or at time zero, right? That's what that little zero means there. And so if you know these three formulas, and you know these three formulas, you can kind of think through a whole lot of problems, but you really need to identify what the order is that you're dealing with, um, and then work with that formula. Um, and then, uh, like I was gonna say over here, this is the half-life, so this is ln, so we're gonna use this reaction, or this formula right here. And if we take the ln of, um, let's say we're at like the half-life, so we're at this this point in the half-life. Um, sorry, this should not be orange. I should have this be gray. Because we're we're doing this this one right here. And so we're at half-life. And so let's say that we start off with like uh one and then we went to um 0.5. So we had some initial amount that was like one whole, and then we're at that half-life, right? And that difference, that should be equal to the negative kt. And what we end up getting when we do that, so let's go ahead and get the calculator out. Um, and yeah, you, you should have access to a calculator on, the, on a test like this, right? So you should be able to do something like this. So you can do like ln.5, and that's negative 0.69 right? Something like that. And then clear that out. Let's do the natural log of one is zero. Okay. And so we subtract that. And that is going to be equal to uh, negative k t. And this is also you can think of this as that k or that t at half life. So this is just a little subscript indicating that it's at a half life. Okay, so that's still one variable there. And so we end up with our, our relationship that you, um, you see right here. This is actually, um, if we have three sig figs, that's what that was if you go back and look back at it. So you can kind of see that this is um, the, the negative right there, negative k times t at the half-life, and you can get rid of the negative on both sides because you can multiply both sides by negative one, and that's that formula right there. So you can derive, this is essentially derived from that. So you can, real, if you're like, wait, which one's my first order? Which one has to do with half-lives? If you know half-lives are first order, which is kind of a conceptual thing, um, then you can link this to that. And you can also kind of plug in numbers and see that like, well, if I did have these other other things and I tried to plug in like 0.5 and, and 1, I don't get a half-life that's in this exact relationship. You actually have it kind of depend on 
the uh, the concentration of A in both those cases. So like it's it's kind of weird if you try and do that, but like you could if you tried to do the same thing with like uh like our point five and our one. It's it doesn't really it doesn't end up giving you the set the same like clean relationship essentially. So also there's something to keep in mind with your second order. Um, when we're talking about second order rates, these are um, things that get faster, like much, much faster when we have more concentration, right? So another way of saying that, that when we are going to increase the concentration, like if you doubled A, like if you have um, 2A here, that's going to end up resulting in it getting squared, right? And so the rate ends up getting times four. So it ends up being four times that, that rate. And so this thing ends up like really, really breaking down very quickly when you have lots of it. And then once you have less of it, it breaks down much less quickly. Um, so it ends up having this relationship where the, the half-life is also variable depending on this. Because if it's going faster at first when you've got a lot of stuff, it, it ends up being slightly less time than if um, it's going slower, like much, much slower when it's got uh, less stuff. Because it's not at this like one-to-one -one ratio. It's not constant, so this is variable. You can think of it be going much faster, even though it's got more stuff. So that kind of overpowers it, and that can make the half life actually be less when you have more stuff, which is kind of weird. But that actually is what ends up happening with these second order reactions. Um, they end up like colliding more with themselves. It's kind of like you're colliding a ton of two different things now together. So that ends up um, doubling the effect of whatever is going on there. So that's kind of the main idea with those. And then also it's a good idea to be able to just think through these graphs and what these things look like when you talk about these concentrations. Because when you want to get the flat line here um, with the zero order, it's a nice flat line when you're talking about the concentration of A going down. Um, and it looks like this with time where it's like, okay, this is... Um, if you think about it like a y is equal to mx plus b situation, and you've got like your um, your your kt, right? And then you've got this a initial, and then this is whatever that a is at at that given time. So you've got that y is equal to mx plus b for zero order there, right? Um, but what ends up happening is when we're looking at these concentrations for the uh, like first and second order, they end up having these like kind of curved lines um, where it's like kind of like something that looks like that. And these guys, they go down very quickly. And then when they're low, they, they go very, very, very slow. Something kind of like that. I think it should be more like the that orange color. Yeah. So the, the blue, this is the flat line. Or the um, what we'll call it, our zero order, and then when we're talking about the uh, the first order, you can kind of see that this is also rearranged. So if we have our um, our LNs, so I think this is the I think this is the gray. And then this is that KT, um, and then. something like this, right? I missed one of my uh, subtractions right here. This should be a subtraction here because this you can see is a negative right there. And if we bring over that initial to the other side, that becomes positive from the negative over here. So this is kind of more the relationship and you can see it's linear when we do the natural log here. And what's interesting is that the um, if you tried to do this and plot out the data, if this is not a flat line, that means that you 
have a second order reaction. Um, it's if this is still curved like this purple, then that means you would need to essentially do like another natural log on it, and then at that point, it's um, turned into a flat line. So this one does become a nice flat line. Um, it does have a positive slope, um, but basically it has to do with like the fact that you've like done like another uh, natural log. And so like how this one that was curved got flattened out, this one that's curved gets flattened out here as well. Um, it just kind of is a little, a little weird, right? Um, so what we end up getting when we're talking about this one is we've got our uh, 1 over a over t. And then that's equal to 1 over initial and then that was uh, 80 I believe right yep something like that so you can imagine also like what's going on a little bit with this by plugging in some numbers here right if you've got a large number in here um, for that large initial here and then this is like let's say you wanted to plug in like maybe one and 0.5 and, and kind of see what goes on there. You can you can do that, right? And you get like one over one, and you get like 0.5 here. So this is like two. And so two and then kt. Um so time is gonna be like to do that, that's gonna take like two t if this is equal to one, right? But then you can change those numbers. So instead of like uh like one and point and point five it's like you can change all kinds of things and it's it gets like the amount of time it takes for half of it to get um used is going to be variable with this one so it's kind of messy some of those calculations but you can think about like okay in general with these graphs what it, when do i see it being flat and it really, really helps you to understand these rates and be able to connect these formulas because that's how you're uh, relating it through the y is equal to mx plus b, right? So if you can understand their relationships, then you can understand like the formulas and you can understand which graph should be flat for the, for the different orders, essentially. Um, and then, it's always, for me, I always think about half-life because that is a good frame of reference. And then you have to add in one of the three that's missing. And so I sometimes am like, wait, am I adding in the second order or the, or the zero order? And um, it, it becomes pretty clear uh, if you try and play around with some numbers. And if you do the natural log thing here with the, uh, the half-life and plug in the numbers, and, and if you plug in 0.5 here, yeah, it's it should become apparent to you at that point, like what, how those things should be related there. Um, always a good idea to plug in some numbers, very simple, and just kind of see what happens, right? Just play around with these formulas. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any good simulations that let you play around with them too much. Hopefully some will come out soon. Okay, but let's look at some typical problems for this. So when we're talking about rate laws, they have to tell you how much this stuff has changed over time. It, it's a rate, right? It's something breaking down. So there has to be some change in mass. There has to be some change in time. There's two main ways they're going to do that. It's going to be either a table or a graph. So you have to be able to work with both if you're trying to solve these problems. So they sometimes give you things like this where they'll give you different concentrations and different rates and you have to kind of figure out how how different they are at those different concentrations. Um, and then there's also ones where they might give you some table or, or something like this, and they want you to like either identify the order of the reaction or explain a little bit, or maybe even write the law. And so this is the same thing, honestly. It's just one is we're working with a table, another is we're working with them graphically, but the logic is the exact same. We're essentially looking at the slope, right? Because we're looking at how the, the slope of this is changing. Because what you can say is like, okay, I have um, some, some rate here. And that's going to be equal to k 
and then concentration up to some some number, right? And so that's like the generic formula that we do for this stuff with these rate laws, because we've we talked a little bit about like rate um, in the last section where you could have zero first, second. You can technically have like third, fourth, or fifth orders, and even more, but they are very, very uncommon. It's much more common to have less order things because the mechanism is unlikely to have that many things colliding at once. So if we look at this, this problem, what we can say is like, all right, what if I have like two times A, does that do two times the rate, right? And if it does, that means that this is the, the first order, okay? If we did the same thing, if I do two times A and it actually makes four times the rate, that means that this is up to the second order because it's two squared, right? So that's the idea with these things is that we're kind of plugging in and seeing if I change this concentration, how much does this change the rate? And so we have um, we have a couple situations here. So we know that the B has been held constant here. So like you could also consider B right over here. But if we have B and it's equal between these two instances, it doesn't really matter what this number is. Because if you have like 0.2 and it's up to the first power and 0.2 it's up to the first power, they contribute equally to the rate on in both situations. So we don't really have to worry so much about this stuff if um, we're holding it constant. So let's say that um, B is constant and uh, then we can plug in A and, and see how the rate changes, right? So we've got our uh, rate of 0 0.005 is equal to A times some concentration of A, then let's say that's point zero or point 0.1, right? There's also this B over here that's being multiplied, but it doesn't really matter. And then we have the, the rate here, which is 0 0.02. And that is when we have, what is this? Or the rate is 0 0.02, and then this is 0.2. So we can look at these and we can say, all right, well, I've doubled this and this got multiplied by four, right? So I've gone and multiplied that by two and this went and got multiplied by, um, by four. So I believe that this is up to the, uh, the second power, right? So we're saying like, oh, is this being squared then? Because it looks to me like when I've doubled this concentration, it's going four times faster, right? Because we've doubled this concentration going four times faster. If B is constant, um, double A, rate is times four. So that's um, the order of that part would be um, two, right, for that part. So this does also have a B in there as well. So if we were holding A constant, we can look at the same situation here and say A is constant. And so we can look at our two uh, our two rates and say, all right, um, if A is constant, we're working with these two. So it's just important to make sure that we're working with that. Uh, the, it looks like 
we have this k. And we now know this is actually some number that's being squared. We could actually solve for k if we wanted to, but we're not actually, I don't think that they asked us to do that in this problem. Um, but we could actually solve for k if we wanted to. So concentration uh, a is 0.1. And then this is the concentration of b. And then the rate was 0, 0.005. And um, 0 0.02. Okay, so we don't know what this is being uh, multiplied by yet. This is that B, this is that A, and this is all in that first instance right there. So that's good. And then we can say there's another rate, and it looked like 0 0.00, I think, 0.25. Was that it? 0 0.0025, yep. Just wanted to give myself space if I needed, needed it. So we've got that, and then we've got K, and we've got our concentration of that. And luckily for us, A has been held constant. So we can kind of like, you know, in a sense, what we're saying is like, we're canceling out this stuff and that's equivalent between these two. And we're interested in how this changed when that changed, right? So if we have a B 0 0.01. All right, so it looks like if this got multiplied by two, this also got multiplied by two, right? Because that's like 25 and this is kind of like 50 in a, in a sense. Yeah. So this is up to like that first, I believe that this is um, to the first power, it has to be. And if we wanted to, we could even go back and now plug in for any three of these cases. This is a system of equations. If you know your system of equations, that's basically what we're doing here. Um, then you can go back to any one of these and plug them in. So you can say, okay, what if I have my um, 0 0.0025, okay, and then I've got my 0.1, to that second power times 0, 1 up to that first power. And I have all my numbers. I have all my exponents. I can now actually solve for k if I wanted to, right? So this is, um, I think I could do it actually without a calculator. So this is 0 0.1 squared, which is 0 0.00 or 0 0.01, right? Um, yeah, you get, you get the main idea is that we can now solve for this stuff. Maybe I could make this be one of my interactive questions where you, um, try and solve for K at this point and check it in that interactive video. Okay. Yeah. Let's try and do that. Yeah. I like that idea. If I don't do that, put a comment on this and I will, I'll add that. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's here's a similar type of problem. This is actually, in my opinion, a lot easier. The a AP uh, people, they love to do this on their test. Um, they love to give you just the graphs and say, tell me the order of the reaction. And basically what you're doing here is being asked, like, when are you going to get the flat line? Is it going to be when you just look at the concentration versus time? Is it going to be when you look at the natural log versus time? Or is it going to be when you look at one over the concentration over time? So it's basically saying, when do we get the flat line? Um, if we look here, you can see that the if I do just draw in a line, uh, this is not really a flat line, right? So we can't really do that. But you can see this is actually much more of a straight line. So this is where we're seeing a straight line here. And then you can also see this is not a straight line. So um, it's flat for the, um, the one over the NO2 concentration. 
And so this is indicating that it's a second order. Another way of saying this is, I mean, this is breaking down very quickly at first and then quite slowly later on. So this is that rate that is, is being squared. So the more the concentration is, the faster it breaks down. And the less concentration there is, the slower it breaks down, but it's like much slower, right? Because um, it got squared. And so you can kind of see that this is not flat here. So it's definitely not um, a zero order. And you can see, okay, well, this isn't flat here. So this is not a zero order or a first order. It has to be second order. So be careful because I I know that they did this on purpose. Um, they didn't order the graphs to line up with a zero first second on purpose. Super, super tricky, right? Because if this had, if you're thinking like, oh, like they've given me the three graphs um, and there's a flat one in, in the middle, you might think, oh, like maybe this is my zero order and this is my first order and this is my second order. But if you actually look at the axes, they've um, they've kind of messed with you a little bit here, right? Because we have the first order is when it gets flat in the natural log. Um, and then this is like that second order, right? So this was flat for the second order um, when it was the one over the concentration. So you really do need to know what those graphs look like to work with these types of problems. Um, and you can also say like, I would explain this saying, um, you can see the rate changing with the concentration with higher concentrations, the, <laughs> my spelling, right? Higher concentrations. The rate is much higher. So it's, it's going forward very, very high. Like there's a big magnitude, right? To that uh, forward reaction when you've got um, a fair amount of that of that reactant. And so if we wanted to write out the rate law with respects to the NO2, you can say the rate is equal to um, K NO2 up to that second power. Because this is a second order reaction. This is essentially saying if you have uh, two times this concentration, you'll get four times the rate. Or if you had three times that concentration, you'll end up having nine times the rate. Or you could say, maybe I've got point um, two times the concentration, and it's point zero two times the rate. So if you've got a smaller concentration, the rate is much slower. So it's going to take long, a long, long time to get rid of half of this going at that rate. That's another way of thinking about that, right? So we can say that the rate law, um, what they were looking for strictly was just what's written in black here. I just wrote in those colors to just kind of demonstrate another way of thinking about this. Um, if you plug in numbers, you can show, show the relationship. And if they actually give you numbers, you can totally plug this in just like this stuff right here. It's like a data table. They have given you, but it's just concentration A and rate. So you just have like point um, A and B, and you've got those different times, and you should be able to plug them in and calculate for these, value, these variables. 
All right, I think that's everything. Um, thank you for joining me. This has been Andrew McLaren. Thank you for McLearning with me. I've got a few more offers that I'd like to let you know about. And remember, like and subscribe. For each video on YouTube, I am making an interactive version using HP5. These will be for sale on Podia. And if you click on the link in the video, you should be able to go directly to that product. I also have two demos I'm going to be linking so you can kind of see what they, these products look like. Um, so I would recommend checking out those demos. I also offer one-on-one -on -one remote tutoring through Wyzant. Please use the links that I have linked below. That way I can get 100% of the uh, hourly rate as opposed to 75. Each video also has a link for my Patreon, and you can join at the $3 level to get some resources I use for tutoring and, or to support the channel. And I also have a $5 raffle level, which you could either get some free online tutoring or five uh, interactive lessons for free. You choose which ones. And then I also have my Teachers Pay Teachers, which has some old lessons that I made from when I used to be a teacher. I may be adding to that. Thank you for spending your time with me. I hope that you learned something.